Well, praise the Lord. Here we are again for another great Wednesday night united. We are excited about what God's doing. We're so good, to, so glad, and it's so good to see everybody. Uh, God's doing some wonderful things. Uh, uh, God is just is blessing. Uh, he's transforming people's lives. We're so blessed uh, at what God is, uh, over what God is doing. We were uh, in prayer meeting on uh, Sunday morning, and uh, the Spirit of the Lord prompted me to say, uh, if you uh, have never spoken with tongues, been filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, just raise your hands right now. The Lord wants to fill you. And uh, there were two individuals sitting in the back row that just lifted their hands and never spoke in tongues, instantly filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, so God's doing some beautiful things in our midst. And uh, we want to continue uh, with this that we've been on, Built in Mercy. Uh, we ministered there uh, Sunday morning uh, on Built in Mercy. And we want to continue. And this comes from... Uh, something the Lord reminded me of from September 5th of 2001 when Pastor Scott Webb was with us at our faith explosion and he made the statement concerning some land that uh, he was seeing in his spirit and uh, exactly what he said was I see a piece of land that God has set aside for this church and then he said where God desires to plant the work and build it and cause it to multiply and this is what the Lord caused me to focus on for it to be a place that people can come in and it will be a refuge and a house of healing and a house of victory and a house of miracles for God can have the freedom to do what he always wants to do and that's be a blessing to people the scripture that we've started off with most of these uh, teachings with is Zechariah chapter 1 verse 16 where the word says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies, and I will build my house there. And we've said, we, I understand that in Zechariah's time, Israel had gone away from God. Uh, they had went after other gods, and, and now God is saying, I'm, I'm going to restore mercy to you, and I'm going to build my house there. But when I read that, the Lord said, that is what I want to do with your churches. I want to build them in mercy. So he's building our churches with mercy so that we can be a blessing. So that we can be a blessing to our city, our state, our nation, our world. Uh, God does not want to heal people and bless them and produce miracles and healing and victory in their life so that he can produce, uh, uh, prove how powerful he is he wants to do that so that he can be a blessing to people, all right? So God desires to show mercy to people, and he desires that his people show mercy to each other. That's not a side issue with God. And uh, if you get this whole series, uh, either on CD, on the podcast, however you want to get it, get a hold of it, uh, we taught about that extensively, how... This is not a side issue with God. But in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7, another scripture that we've mentioned a few times in this teaching, but Jesus says something in Matthew 5, 7. Notice, he says, Blessed are the merciful, and here's why they're blessed, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy. Remember that mercy is not just letting someone off the hook. That's, that's a side of mercy. But that's not mercy in its entirety. Mercy is not just giving someone a break. Mercy, the best definition I found, is active compassion. Active compassion. We made the statement in the last message that mercy is is you entering into the circumstance of a person and there being total identification with that person's circumstance. And we quoted the scripture from the book of Hebrews where it says that it behooved Jesus to be made like unto his brethren so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest. 
so that he could show mercy and be faithful in showing mercy. Hallelujah. The, the, the whole reason that Jesus can be so merciful is he was willing to identify with you and I. All right? So mercy is this active compassion, this total identification with the other person's circumstance. The Weist Bible says spiritually prosperous are those who are merciful because they themselves shall be the objects of mercy. And I've said this over and over again, you cannot be the object of mercy if mercy is not an active force. If it's not something that's active and moving, you can't be the object of mercy. So mercy is active compassion. One definition is this. It is one definition is compassion shown to an offender. So, so, in other words, if you're going to be merciful, it's something that is shown. It's something that is acted on. Hallelujah. And Jesus says, show mercy, or active compassion, and mercy, or active compassion, will be shown to you. I'm telling you, I'm going to say this probably a lot in this teaching. It's always best to show mercy. It's always best to show mercy. All right? Why? Because there will come a day, I, ta I taught you Sunday morning, there will come a time when you're going to need mercy. You're going to need mercy. Now, in James chapter 2, James chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, the King James Bible uh, says, it kind of succinctly, we'll read the Amplified here in a moment. It has a little uh, more drawn out meaning. James 2, 12 and 13. So speak and do as they that will be judged by the law of liberty. For he will have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. The Amplified Bible says this, so speak and act as people should who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Well, what's the law of liberty? Well, James explains it. The moral instruction given by Christ is specially about love. Especially about love. For to him who has shown no mercy, the judgment will be, here it is, merciless or merciless, but mercy full of glad confidence exults victoriously over judgment. So notice what James said, Jesus' brother, he makes it very clear. If we've shown mercy, and if we show mercy in our judgment, we'll receive mercy from the Father. In, in any situation, now I know that, that this in its perfect context is talking about uh, what we refer to as the judgment day or, or the time that we stand to, to be judged and, 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 and to have rewards given out and these different things. But remember a couple things. James is talking to believers, so this is something believers have to deal with. And secondly... The Word of God is for our daily living. So this is not just something that, that I'm doing because of when I get there, although it's part of it. It's something I want to do every day. Why? I need mercy every day. I, I need mercy week in and week out. I need mercy whether it's, it's something I willingly did, something that, that came up and caught me off guard, uh, uh, an attitude, a, a wrong perception, a wrong thought, a wrong action. I need mercy. Uh, just, I need to grow in that area. I need mercy. Amen. You know, you, you have mercy on a child when they're growing, when, when, when they're, they're coming up. You know, you, 
You have mercy on a child when they're, they're learning uh, uh, how to do things, when they're, they're being potty trained, they're learning how to dress themselves, they're learning how to eat. You know, there are a lot of messes when they're learning how to do these things. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of, of, of sheets that have to be washed. There's a lot of blankets that have to be washed. Amen. There, there's food that has to be picked up off the floor. Why? They're learning. They're, they're learning how to feed themselves. They're, they're learning how to take care of themselves. They're learning how to, to go to the bathroom on their own. They're learning how to dress themselves. And they're going to put their shirt on backwards. And they're going to put their shoes on the wrong feet. Now, I, I know that's a very elementary illustration. But what, what do they need? Mercy. They need instruction, but they need mercy. Hallelujah. It's, it's the same way with our fellow believers. People sitting around you in church need mercy. They, they may not be as far along in the things of God as you are, or they may not be as far along in that certain area as we are. What they need is mercy. They don't need to always be corrected. They need to have mercy shown. Hallelujah. Do, do you see that? Because notice, we can never afford to be merciless in our judgment of our brother or sister. We just cannot afford it. Hallelujah. Now, now listen. <laughs> there, there are those of us that come from a long line of know-it-alls. <laughs> right? That, that guy's always wrong. That person's always wrong. Amen. We can't afford to have that merciless type of attitude. Why? Because I want mercy. Come on, you want mercy. <laughs> mercy is what we always want. I want mercy for me. I want mercy for my brother or my sister. I want mercy for you. Right? L little change in the movie. Mercy on you. Mercy on your family. Mercy on your cow. I want mercy. Amen? I, I want mercy in my life. You want mercy in your life. See, you got to think about that. Before you rise up and make a decision, remember, I want mercy. I, I want the reciprocal back into my life to be mercy. Amen. James said that we would be judged under the moral instruction given by Christ. And then he said, especially about love. Especially about love. Now, in Luke 6... Jesus says some things, and we're going we're gonna to look at a couple verses in the Gospels, and we're, we're going to have uh, three points that tell us that in order to be merciful, three things that we cannot be. But Luke 6, verse 36, Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. The Wish Bible says, Be becoming compassionate. Now, when you read that in the Greek, and it says, Be becoming, it's continuous action. It's like the uh, Scripture in Ephesians 5 where it says, do not be drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled. The, the, the same phrase there, it's be, being filled. It denotes constant action. So, be becoming compassionate. When? Every day. Every day. Even as your Father is compassionate. 
Now stop right there. We're going to read on, but, but understand something. Jesus would not tell us to be something the Father is if we could not be that. And he said to be compassionate even as your Father is compassionate. Now when we think that, when we first think of our Father, very often people think perfection. People think, uh, you know, uh, just God in the perfect sense. How can I ever do that? How can I ever be merciful or compassionate like God is? Well, the book of Philippians, Paul said that God will give you the will to do and to be everything He's asked you to do. So He asks you to do it, and then He gives you the ability to get it done. All right? And then He went on and said, And stop judging in a censorious manner, and you will positively not be the object of censorious judgment. And stop condemning, and you will positively not be condemned. Be setting free, and you will be set free. Hallelujah. So the first thing we see here is that we are forgiving without reference to sin or crime. It's important. We are to forgive without making a reference to the issue. I forgive you. Somebody might come up and say, look, I need you to forgive me for something. Done. But you don't even know what it was. Don't need to know. You're asking me to forgive you. Amen. Well, pastor, can it be that simple? It can be that simple. Listen, we do it with other things. Someone will come up and say, look, I want you to agree with me about such and such. Done. Agreed. I don't need to know why you want me to forgive you. I just need to forgive you. I mean, I don't, I don't want to really hear about all you held against me. Right? But people will come up, oh, pastor, I need you to forgive me. I've, I've held this against you and I've held this against you. Well, they're just glad you think so much of me. That, see, that's the thought that tries to come into your mind. No, no, just I need you to forgive me. Okay, done. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Amen. The word censorious, it means this. Severely critical or fault-finding, severely critical, or fault-finding, severely critical, or fault-finding. I uh, heard recently of a, of a radio personality that, that I had listened to for a number of years that uh, uh, on a certain sports radio station there in the, the metro, and uh, in any event, uh, he was always very critical, very hard on people, and I remember I used to listen to him, and, and, and it was usually on my way home from the office uh, uh, in the afternoon, and it would always come into my mind, and I'd call his name sometime uh, in the car. I'd say, man, you, you need to watch being critical, critical. Critical, the critic. When, when a person becomes critical, they're setting themselves up as the standard. I'm the standard, and I'm measuring you by what I think. Folks, the Word is the standard. We are all to hold ourselves to this standard. I'm not supposed to hold you to the standard of the Word. I hold myself to the standard of the Word. Amen. D do you understand? And, and when a person becomes critical, then they become the standard. 
And, and I'm not being hard, I'm just, I'm saying, I have enough to do to hold myself to the standard of the Word. So, anyway, back to this story. And eventually, I, I heard not too long ago, uh, he said some things that were, that were really, really overly critical and uh, re really got over into a personal area with a certain sports figure uh, there in the metro area. And, and uh, they fired him. He got fired. But you know what his response was? I've done nothing wrong. Criticism will not let you see where you need mercy. T tell your neighbor, criticism will not let me see where I need mercy. Remember what, what Jesus said? And, and we talked about it Sunday where Jesus said the two men went up to the temple and the one man, the, the religious guy, was standing there saying, Lord, I thank you that I'm not an adulterer, I'm not an extortioner, I'm not a liar, and I'm not like this guy. He pointed at the other guy, I'm not like this guy. I give tithe of this, I do this, right? And, but it says the publican wouldn't even lift his eyes up, he stood afar off, and he said, Lord, be merciful to me. And Jesus said, who do you think went down to his house justified? He, he said, right? He said, because there's one that exalts himself and he won't be forgiven. Then there's one that humbles himself and he will. Criticism will not let you see where you need mercy. Oh, glory. So in order to be merciful as my Father is merciful, I cannot be, number one, I cannot be critical and fault-finding. Cannot be critical and fault-finding. Because something I've learned is this. Finding fault or finding a fault in someone else is the easiest thing in the world. Because fault just means a defect or an imperfection. A flaw, a failing, a misdeed, a transgression. It, it means a, a defect or an imperfection, a flaw, a failing, a misdeed, a transgression. And what happens is that people will look and find the defect in their brother or sister and then begin to criticize. Hallelujah. Censorious criticism or fault finding. Jesus said, if we're doing this, we should stop it. And what would be the result? We would not be judged in the same manner. Look, I don't want God looking for my faults. You, you understand? Or my defects, or my transgressions, or my flaws. How, however major or minor that they may be. Amen. So what that means is I have to cease being fault-finding with my brother or sister. Now, why is this so important? Because it grows me up. It causes me to mature. Maturity is the goal of the Christian life. And the less fault-finding I am, the more maturity I'm gaining. The, the most mature men and women of God that I know really have nothing bad to say about anybody. This is important because everything that you're believing God for, everything that you need from God is tied to this. It's, it's tied to this. I, I've known people in the past that, they, that ministers that uh, were in the ministry and needed God to bless their ministry and needed God to bless them with, with uh, finances and they, and they would criticize other ministers. 
They would criticize Brother Copeland. They would criticize Brother Jerry. They would criticize all these men. And, 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 and they would say, yeah, they talk about living by faith. But if I had hundreds of thousands of partners, I could talk big like that too. You see, whether they have hundreds of thousands of partners or not, the attitude from that minister is critical. He's saying they don't really have faith because they've got a partner base. Right? But, but, but what, is, what did the Apostle Paul say? He said, who are you to criticize and judge another man's servant because to God he rises or falls? And if he is missing it, Paul said, God is able to make him stand. You understand? I don't want to be critical of someone else that's serving God. Because even if they are missing it, God will take an opportunity at some point and help them and empower them. If they're missing it, He'll show it to them. Amen. And, and the same way with us. Do you understand? If, you, if, if you've got an issue that you're dealing with tonight, God will show you how to overcome it. God will show you how to overcome it. You keep your heart right. You keep, you keep criticism and, and fault finding out of your life. And I promise you, it won't be very long. You'll get victory over that. Because I refuse to find fault. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. See, I don't, I don't want to be critical of, of anybody's ministry, of anybody's life. I've watched people before that were just critical of other people's marriages, critical of the way they spent money, critical of the way they did this, and critical of the way they did that. My wife has an acronym. It's N-O-M-B. That stands for None of My Business. When, when some, where someone else's marriage is concerned, someone else's spending habits, someone else's child rearing, it is N-O-M-B to you. None of your business. If they ask you for help, help them. Give them advice. Don't be critical. Why? Because you want your marriage to be heaven on earth. You want to have an easy time with your children. Amen. Amen. See, I want to be open to help. When I'm critical, I shut myself down from receiving help. Just, I can't do it. I can't receive. Because I'm constantly finding fault and being critical. Am I helping you all with this? Jesus said, if we're doing this, we should stop it. Because the way we deal with others will be the way we are dealt with, period. That, that's that's, that's what will happen. In Matthew 7, Matthew chapter 7. Tell your neighbor, say, grow, baby. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you judge, you'll be judged. With what measure you meet, it'll be measured. Why do you behold the mote in your brother's eye and consider not the beam that's in your own? Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull the mote out of your eye? And behold, a beam is in your own eye. Now I want you to see something. These verses are in the context of that same subject, censorious Criticism, fault-finding, being severely critical. This is the standard. What, what's the standard? Judge not that you be not judged. Now, remember something here. This is so important. The sinners have picked up this phrase and used it to justify a sinful lifestyle. Can't nobody judge me but God. Right? 
All I know, the Bible says, judge not, you won't be judged. Well, it does say that. But it's not talking about justifying a sinful lifestyle or justifying a mistake or, or justifying anything of that nature. You know, I learned a long time ago, if, if you miss it, don't try to justify it. Just repent, confess it, be honest. Amen. Be honest with God. If, if it didn't, did it in the front of a bunch of, of people, be honest with them. If you did it in front of your family, be honest with them. Confess it. Be honest. If you miss it privately, repent privately. If you miss it publicly, repent publicly. But here's the point that I'm making. This is the standard. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Now, folks, that's freeing. That is a beautiful promise. Look how much trouble I can avoid by just not being critical. Because the more people that come into our church that have issues, that have problems, that have addictions, that have uh, circumstances in their life, that there's going to be people that come to our church that live lifestyles that are extra biblical, that are not what the Bible says. Well, what are we going to do? You can't criticize. You can't be critical. You can't be fault-finding. You've got to be loving. You have to let the Word work. Amen? Do, do you see this? Glory to God. When people come in that have religious beliefs and religious views, that are not quite what we uh, uh, see in the Word of God and what you've been taught, you can't pull out your Word of Faith hammer and just whack. Amen. You, 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 you've got to spend time and allow the Word to work in their lives. That's why I said we want to be built in mercy. I want to build a place where I can be what I always want to be, and that is a blessing to people. Amen. So that's the standard. Jesus said don't find fault and be severely critical. Now here's why. One of the reasons. Only the Father knows the heart of our brother or our sister. Therefore, judgment is His prerogative alone. I've said this over the years. I ministered this not to, well, it's been a couple years ago, that the only one that qualifies to criticize is the one who has no flaws. The Father is the only one that qualifies to be the critic because He's perfect. You see, that doesn't mean I can't tell somebody something that they're doing is wrong if it's wrong according to the Word of God. Telling you you're wrong and being critical are two different things. Again, criticism is setting yourself up as a standard. Criticism is looking for a flaw, looking for a fault. Telling somebody they're wrong is you're just saying, look, this is wrong. If someone's going down a one-way street and you honk your horn and stop them and say, hey, you're going the wrong way. Well, they may not appreciate it. They might even get mad at you for whatever reason. But you didn't do anything wrong. You're not criticizing them. You're just telling them you're going the wrong way. Forget the splinter or the log. Why? Work on not being critical. Amen. That, that's where a lot of people take that. Well, you know, look. You see a splinter. No, no, no. Forget the splinter or the log and just work on not being critical. Amen. The second thing that I cannot be if I am going to avoid being critical, if I want to be merciful as the Father is, I cannot be condemning, condemning. In John chapter 8, 
John chapter 8, verse 3. Familiar passage. It says, The scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. They said to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned. What do you say? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his and and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said, He that is without sin among you, let him cast first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now I want you to see something. Mercy doesn't condone or minimize sin. I need you to see this. This woman had knowingly done what she was charged with. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? Because you don't commit adultery accidentally. Oh, how did I end up in this married man's bed? Or whatever, right? How how did I get here? No, it wasn't an accident. All right? You don't accidentally do that. Now, there are things, Paul says in Galatians, he says if a brother's overtaken in a fault, in other words, he fell, something overtook him, something overcame him. I understand those things can happen. This is not one of those things. All right. Regardless, and what you'll hear people say is, well, I want to know where was the man. You know, you know, they brought the woman, but where was the man? She was set up. This was a setup to get to Jesus. It sure was. But listen, regardless of whether they brought the man or not, regardless if she had been set up, she was guilty. You understand? I'm, I'm going to make a point with this. Notice what Jesus said. He simply said, If you have no sin, you can cast the first stone. He did not say, If you've never committed adultery. He said, If you have no sin, then you qualify to throw the first stone. If you have no sin. Do you see this? Amen. So he's telling them, if you've never missed the mark, throw the stone. Meaning what? There are things you have done that either you didn't get caught uh, uh, with, or nobody knows, or you were let off the hook. If you've never sinned, if you have no sin, and remember what John said, He said, if we say that we have no sin, we're liars. Right? Now now listen, here's something to take to heart. So if I know I've missed it, and I know I've made mistakes, then I want to be merciful to those that make mistakes. Again, I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm not minimizing it. Oh, glory to God. Amen. I've I've dealt with people before that my heart just went out to them. And I had to deal with what they were doing. I couldn't minimize it. You can't condone it. It's destroying their life. But my heart goes out to them. Mercy. I want to deal with them in mercy. I always want to give somebody a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance. Why? Number, number one, I'm a believer. Number two, I'm a pastor. There's always hope for people to change. 
in, in my mind. Pastor Caldwell says pastors think they can fix everybody. And we do. We think if you just sit up under my good preaching long enough, it'll, it'll change you. Amen. And it is good preaching, all right? And it will change you. Hallelujah. Jesus then, notice, told the woman straight, what you've been doing is sin. Now you're forgiven and you're not condemned, so go and quit sinning. Go and don't keep doing what you've been doing. What is that? Mercy. Notice Jesus didn't find fault. Right? How, how much freedom would that produce in people's life if we just said, look, just quit what you're doing. Don't, don't, don't worry about proving it. Don't. The Lord told me one time about something. He said, don't use so many words, just do it. Just, I'm telling you tonight, just do it. And I'm not, I'm not even talking about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, some, some form of overt sinful activity. I mean, in any area, if, if I find I've been critical, if I find I've been fault finding, just stop. Just don't do it anymore. Well, how do I do that? Just demand of yourself, I'm not going to do that anymore. See, Jesus was able to help this woman because he didn't overlook the wrong, but see what he did what James said. This is one of the instances where James probably got the revelation. He, he, he was not overtly critical. He was not harsh he, because he's merciful as his Father is merciful. Mercy requires that we cease from doing the activity for which we have received mercy. If you've received mercy for something, then you have to cease that activity. You should cease that activity because you received mercy for it. Oh, glory. Amen. You know, I've had people before that, that uh, uh, blew up at me and said things that were mean. And they've came back to me and said, Pastor, please forgive me. Well, of course. And, you know, I've had them go on and, and, and never, never get upset with me again. That I knew of. But they, they, they never said those words again. Now, then I've had people say, well, you know, I'm sorry for what I said, but here's why I said it. You can't show mercy to that person. What if this woman would have said, well, yeah, I committed adultery, but I was set up. Yeah, I committed adultery, but I committed adultery, but where's the man? No, that, look, in order to receive mercy, she had to know and be aware and act like she needed mercy. Mercy has to be received. It has to be shown, but it has to be received. I want to be a recipient of mercy. Hallelujah. Now, let's look at one last verse. The, the third part. So, so the number one thing is I have to refuse to be critical and fault finding. Secondly, I have to refuse to be condemning. And thirdly, I have to set the other party free. In Mark chapter 11. Thank you, Jesus. Tell your neighbors, if you ever need mercy, I'll show you mercy. Hallelujah. Uh, Mark eleven, twenty-five through 26, he says, And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have aught or if you have anything against any, that your Father which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. The Amplified Bible says, And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, let it drop, leave it, let it go. 
Wow. Now, now, you know, Jesus is talking in the context of praying. But, you know, this is any time. You got to set the other party free. Amen. Set the other party free. If, if, as we said, if I'm going to be merciful as my father's merciful. Notice what he said again. Anything against anyone, forgive him. Right? Forgive him. And remember what we said about forgiveness. It, it, it does not mention, we said, it, it does not mention the, uh, let me see exactly how I said it because I want to get this right. We, we don't mention no reference to sin or crime against us. So forgiving is, okay, I forgive it. And then what? You don't bring it up. Right? I, the, listen, the Lord's working with me on this. And, and so, you know, you know how it works. When the Lord works with me on something, then I work with us on it. He's working with me on this, not bringing up people's past. Or areas where they made mistakes or failed. And not only not bringing it up, not allowing it to come into my mind. How can I ever forget my mistakes and my past failures if I'm always remembering everybody else's? I have to forgive, first of all. He said, forgive him. Here it is. Let it drop. Leave it. Where? Where it's at. Let it go. Don't hold on to it. Let it go. See, what are you doing? You're setting that person free. You're letting that person have liberty. I got to set the other party free. Hallelujah. And he says why? So that the Father can forgive our failings and shortcomings, and let them drop. Oh, that's what I want. Amen. And, and remember, I'm saved. You're saved. You're born again. When, when we get to heaven and we stand before Jesus, what this is saying is this, is there are rewards and things that I can miss if I don't let it go. It is not worth missing something that the Father has reserved for me because I won't forgive or I want to be critical or I don't want to show mercy or I want to be fault-finding or whatever the case may be. But I have to let it go. Leave it. Let it go. Folks, listen. As we're wrapping this up, it is not worth the spiritual anguish that will come into your life to be critical of someone. Just not worth it. It's just not worth it. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I've, I've, had, I've had people in my life that would come and, and ask me to forgive them. And, I, and I'd forgive them and, and leave it and let it go. And I've had people say, how could, how could you just forgive that person? When you understand... When you understand, listen, it's not a fear thing, but when you understand that the standard is forgive and the standard is don't judge, don't be critical, then it becomes incumbent upon me if I want to be a mercy shower to not be critical, to not be judgmental, to not be fault finding. Let's just make a decision in our hearts tonight. We're not going to find fault with people. I mean, I, I don't care how it is. I remember, I remember, uh, well, it's been many years ago now, many, many years ago. And, uh, you know, 
when Pastor Michelle and I first got married, I, I've said this before that, that when we got married, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of people that wanted us to be married except us. We wanted to be married. And uh, we did. We got married. And uh, it was just this hailstorm of criticism. You know, I wasn't ready to be married. And I was getting married too quick. And, and uh, uh, one of the funniest ones that I ever heard was that she was getting married to me because she wanted a sugar daddy. I was working at Piggly Wiggly. At that time, working at Piggly Wiggly, uh, uh, stocking shelves as a stalker. I, I was driving a, uh, an old beat-up VW Bug. I, I mean, if she was looking for a sugar daddy, she didn't find a very sweet one because I, I didn't have much sugar. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. But, you know, I've often, and, and I had to overcome that, but I've, I've no, not the sugar daddy part, what, what the people said. Hallelujah. <laughs> Say, what did he talk about tonight? Ah, oh, sugar daddy, something like that. I don't, <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. No, I, I had to overcome the fact that so many people weren't happy for us and wanted want our lives to be better. I had to overcome that. You know, one of the days, one of the things that happened that gave me so much victory over it was Pastor Michelle and I were talking to a person one time, and they just really went off on us about, uh, you know, who did we think we are and, and all these things. And I remember taking my wife's hand and saying, come on, sweetheart, let's just go do what God called us to do. And, and now here we are, uh, uh, Close to 30 years later, 26 years of heaven on earth, doing what God wants us to do. I promise you, hear me folks, I promise you, we would not be pastoring two churches. We would not be doing all that God wants us to do had we not learned to leave some things, let them drop and let them go. You got to leave it. That's, that's some of that besetting issues where Paul said, lay aside the weight the weight and the sin that so easily besets you? Well, you may not be participating in sin, but if you have a weight of criticism or a weight of fault-finding, it can beset you. It can, it can throw you off course. Amen. And to, be, to tell you the real truth about it, Pastor Michelle even has this on a deeper level than I do. She's taught me a lot about forgiveness. She, she has been the ultimate example of the love and the forgiveness of God in my life. Amen. Now, I'm saying all that to say, so, you know, we overcame that. And, and a, lot, a lot of those people that were so critical and so fault-finding of us, things didn't end up so well for them. Not because they did it to us, but because that was their lifestyle. Amen. When you see somebody struggling with something, like we, we taught, uh, uh, what was it, three Wednesdays ago, the, the Good Samaritan, when he saw that man laying there half dead, he didn't say, well, he shouldn't have been here. You know, what was he thinking coming down to this area by himself? What, you know, this is his fault. No, the Bible says that he went and he, and he, and he poured in oil and disinfecting wine and he bandaged him up and put him on his own uh, uh, animal, took him to the, to the inn, paid for two days lodging and took care of him, and then had to go on business. And he told the man, he said, take care of him, and when I come back, if this isn't enough, I'll pay you what, I, what he owes you. And Jesus said, which of these men showed mercy to his neighbor? And the guy said, the one that helped him. He said, yep, go and do likewise. You see that? That's how mercy is shown. Mercy doesn't say, well, they made their bed hard, let them lay in it. Amen. Mercy, mercy doesn't say, well, it serves you right. You danced to the tune, now pay the band. Well, you might have danced to the tune and there might be a payment that needs to be paid. And 
But here, here's the thing. For us as believers, that's not our mindset. That's not our heart set. Lord, show them mercy. Father, I want everybody to have mercy. I want everyone to come in contact with mercy. Why? That's what I want. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Well, our prayer ministers are coming to the front at this time. And we're going to pray a corporate prayer. You can stand on your feet. We're going to pray a corporate prayer. But if you need individual prayer, if you need somebody to agree with you, someone to lay hands on you, someone to pray for your healing, your deliverance, your victory, maybe you just want to talk about something that you're dealing with. If that's what you would like, then after we're done with the corporate prayer and we say the vision, you can certainly make your way to the front and they will pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray for every person that's here tonight, every person that's under the sound of my voice. Father, that we would just examine our hearts and say, Lord, is there an area where criticism is attempting to overcome me? Is there an area, Father, where I'm in fault finding? Lord, maybe I'm the person that, that someone's criticizing or that someone is finding fault with, and I need to forgive them. Father, I thank you that you said in your word that it is you that, work, that works in us, in us to will, in other words, to give us the desire, and to do, to give us the ability and the power to do what you've asked us in your word. And so, Father, right now tonight, we leave it, we drop it, we let it go. We refuse to be condemning, and we refuse to be fault-finding. And we thank you that the victory is ours, and that we walk in abundance, and we walk in more than enough, and that the power of God is what is so evident in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And Amen. Well, don't forget Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And then, of course, Sunday night at 6 p.m., Pastor Michelle will be ministering a powerful word. I'm telling you, I can't say enough about what she's been preaching. Uh, those messages have been words from heaven. I'm telling you, what she has been ministering recently, we need to bottle that up and get it to everybody in America because that is so powerful, what she's been ministering uh, uh, in our churches. So definitely be there and, and uh, 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 get your heart full of the Word of God that she's going to be ministering. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, come on, say it with me. The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you.